All right, um, welcome back and it's Newsline and I thank you for staying with us. Now let's take you to the ancient city of Kano, which is a living testament of history. Every nook and cranny tells a story in tradition and culture in this ancient city. Now one such story is that of an ordinary well that became the heart of a thriving commercial center, Kaswa Kumi. Now, this isn't just any marketplace. It's one of the oldest and largest markets in Africa. It's a place where commerce and culture have intertwined for centuries. But as with many historical gems, Kaswa Kumi is facing the relentless pressures of modernity. And of course, our correspondent, Amino Umar, invites us to walk through the market storied parts offering a glimpse into its past glory and of course raising questions about what lies ahead for this iconic marketplace. It is an undeniable fact that Kano is the center of commercial activities that has specialized markets for various merchandise that attracts merchants from various parts of the country and beyond. Kurumi Market is the oldest of all the markets which existed long before the slave trade. History has it that, unlike other cities that make their markets, in Kanu, it was the market that made the city. The market started long before the area was inhabited. It was only hunters who transacted through trade by land. For those who don't know who Kanu Man is, a visit to this market tells you much about him. The market sustained the olden day trades with foreign canoe made from cotton by the local weavers as one of the attractions. Musa Ali is one of the many in this market that is improving on the past and connecting with present as his products are patronized as far as Cameroon. We thank God as the market existed before even our parents and we are now taking part in trading in this market. Despite the historic position of Kurumi market and its strategic place in attracting tourists, not much has been done to preserve the market, which is why its custodians have so much worry. The place should be preserved as people come from far places just to see the market. This well, which was discovered hundreds of years before the market, is one of the landmarks in this market that showcases the traces of history. Hmm. Now our next story is one of resilience and hope. Death may be sudden and inevitable. But when it strikes in such a cruel, deliberate manner, it leaves behind more than just heartache. It leaves an indelible scar. Now, the harrowing ordeal of 19-year-old Abubakar Aliu, who was buried alive, serves as a haunting reminder of both the resilience of the human spirit and the importance of a timely intervention. And as Lawal Salu Inwa reports, Abubakar's story could have ended in a tragedy, but thanks to the bravery of a good Nigerian, his life was snatched back from the jaws of death. Here is Abubakar Aliyu Halzi Anhati, who escaped suffocation to death in Gawaiki village of Zaga local government area. The unfortunate incident began at Abuja after the victim was accused of stealing the phone of his cousin brother Yahya Abdul Qadir at a place where they work as laborers to earn a living. However, despite their boss promised to settle the matter by paying the sum of 35,000 naira out of Abu Bakr Ali money, the two suspects deceived the victim through inviting him to effect labor work and buried him alive in Zaria. The 19 year old Abu Bakr Ali, while narrating the ugly incident, said they had beaten and tied him up until he lost his conscience before they buried him in an uncompleted building a few meters away from their family house. <laughs> 
They removed all my clothes but my knicker and told me that they will cover my head too when they come back. This is where Abu Bakr Aliyu buried alive and he has been dead for over an hour. Luckily enough, someone passing around had some sobbing and called the attention of the people to come to his rescue. When I went there, I asked him, who did this to you? He said, Yahya and Abdullah. People were calling on to dog him out. Then I insisted to call the security first. When we came back from the hospital on the following day, the boy was still complaining. Then we took him back and checked where they tied and beaten him up. All has gone. It was very unfortunate incident, but Alhamdulillah, the boy is alive now. He was later taken to the hospital where he regained his conscience and received some treatment while the suspect fled away before their mother was apprehended by the security personnel. We went there immediately. We took some pictures for an evidence before we saved him. The letter proceeded to the hospital. The two brothers and suspects who happened to be cousin brothers to the victim are now in police custody in Kaduna for further investigation. In a list signed by the police public relations officer Mansur Hassan, the case will be carefully investigated and professionally handled. Abu Bakr Ali, who now has the knowledge of the real definition of light and dark, is back to normal life with friends and family after the horrific incident. Hmm. Uh, poverty isn't a natural phenomenon. It's man-made and sometimes breaking free from its grip can take generations. In Maduguri, Pauline Van Akuche, tells the story of one man whose life was turned upside down by poverty and the family's desperate struggle to survive. Mohammed Sharif Gambo, a father of 10, has seen his life crumble around him as once a thriving businessman now struggles to provide for his eight remaining children after the recent loss of one child and the other married. His cab transportation business to Abuja collapsed last year when his bag containing 300 cabs went missing, leaving him with no capital to revive the business. I see my predicament as an act of God. We need help to access medical care for my three children. It is the economic situation that made it so. We are calling on all to come to our aid, especially with food items, as we currently survive on maize grid and cooking oil. Evicted from his rented apartment, Mohammed and his family now live in this uncompleted building and begging to survive. The living conditions are there, especially when it rains. NTA's visit revealed a devastating situation as the mother was hospitalized with their youngest child for years who, like two other siblings, had gone blind due to malnutrition and hunger. The first time I saw them begging on the street, I realized they were blind. I called them and asked them what they need, and they said they need food, which I bought for them. He cannot feed them. Uh, he cannot even clothe them. Their food, their health, and even the shelter where they are living, Somebody borrowed him so that he can stay for this place. The condition of the three blind and minority children, these 10 years and eight respectively, is particularly distressing. However, hope arrived when NTA involved the Ministry of Women Affairs, which promptly responded with essential items, cash, food, toiletries, toiletries and more. NTA, Meduguri and social media have tried because, if not because of them, we will not know that this thing is happening. But what they did, the NTA Meduguri and the social media, that's the reason why we are here. While this brings temporary relief to Mohammed, his three blind and minority children urgently need medical attention to regain their health. Mohammed's story is a testament to the struggles of many families living on the edge in Meduguri. Will they receive the help they need to overcome their tragic circumstances? Keep your fingers crossed as we follow up for more updates. <laughs> 
Thank you, NTA Medigari, for this story. And we know Newsline will always count on you for that update. But we're not done with Medigari yet. Uh, Pauline Vanna is still standing by. And as they say, insanity is hereditary. And you get it from being a mother. And honestly, there's something to that. Now, if you think your job is tough, then try swapping places with a mom for just a day. Now, imagine the challenges of motherhood amplified by being a single mother and then magnified even further when you're facing rejection from your own parents, the very people who should offer you comfort and mental support. Unfortunately, this is the heartbreaking reality for a mother of six who not only has to battle the overwhelming demands of raising her children, but is also struggling with her mental health and isolation of being turned away by her own family. Of course, we know it's not just an isolated case, but it's a painful story shared by many women. But the woman we're about to meet is fighting to keep her head above water. In our next report, again, takes a closer look at the circumstances that led to this mother's rejection and she explores whether financial hardship might be at the heart of this tragic situation. Yagana, a mother of six, has faced unimaginable challenges since her divorce from her second husband, with her five children from her late husband and one-year-old son from her second marriage, was sent away by her father leaving them to fend for themselves. For two months, Yagana and her children have been sleeping in front of her father's house with effort made by neighbors to reunite them, but her father refused and later relocated to Adamawa State, threatening to harm anyone who tried to bring her back, not even her siblings in the house. <laughs> I don't know what ensued between her and her father. The second time the father is sending her and her children away from the house, and we have pleaded with him to give her the outer shop to stay with her children, but he refused. We confronted the father, and he claimed he sent her out because she hit his head with a stick, and he cannot take her back. NTS visit shed light on the dear circumstances of Yagana's life, particularly on a rainy night, and raised questions about what could have driven a father to banish his daughter and grandchildren from their family home. Yagana remained speechless, but her daughter shared their story. On a Salah day upon her return from each prayer, and was hungry, so she decided to eat the father's cucumber, which triggered his anger. She searched for the cucumber to replace it, but she couldn't find to buy. Then he sent us piking to return. As her older children found shelter elsewhere, Yagana struggled to care for her breastfeeding son until a tragic incident occurred when she mistakenly scalded him with hot water, attempting to treat an infection in addition to an attempt to circumcise the child with a blade. Recognizing Yagana's depression and need for support, the Ministry of Women Affairs and a human rights activist stepped in and took her and her son to a rehabilitation center for proper care where she had previously received treatment for her mental health. With the every commissioner that we have for women affairs, uh, for maybe to cater for her needs, that is giving them food stuff and whatsoever it is, and some, some, I mean some kind of psychosocial support that will ease up the problem. And I'm sure by the time we meet the father and tell him that what is his problem, maybe if he mentioned it to us, we can assist him. As I speak, we are trying to locate the husband and also communicate with her father. But as a first step, we went to the neuropsychiatric hospital, where the boy is, how the wound he came with managed in the clinic. We really want to thank His Excellency the Governor, who has made it a priority that any of such cases must be given adequate attention. Yagana's story will continue as she receives treatment and support, and a new chapter will unfold after confronting her father about his actions. <laughs> What can I say to you, NTA Medugiri and Pauline Vanakuji? Thank you. And also thank you to the state government for responding. You're watching the line.
Time to take a short break. Please don't go away. Thank you for joining us again. Now, Gary or Cassava Flakes, man's timeless companion, has inspired many humorous odes. Like the one that says, Gary is kind and caring. Even if it gets you blood vision when taken without milk. Now, this speaks to the vital role Gary plays in our diet. However, producing Gary has long been a laborious process, especially in rural areas. But in Lokoja, Gisted, a young innovator, Garuba Yidusa, is changing that. Now, using his knowledge, he has created a mini semi automated Gary processing plant to make production easier for small scale farmers. And our correspondent Solomon Ayede reports on this inspiring achievement. In a display of ingenuity in electrical electronics, Garuba Yunusa, an ND computer scientist from Kogi State Police, is spearheading a transformative shift in the traditional method of Gary processing. His locally engineered semi automated Gary processing machine is poised to redefine the industry landscape, aligning with the federal government's agenda for food sufficiency and security. So I used to see the way my people fry in Gary. Sometimes my father advised cassava at the end, no motor to convey or no process, uh, initial processing is not there. Everything get up, get, end up waste. So I decided, started thinking, what can I do to assist these people? to assist my parents, to assist farmers entirely, to make cassava processing more easier in order to avoid some, uh, so many things they go through. Yunusa's innovation encompasses a range of processing stages from cassava peeling to smashing, pressing and frying. By leveraging his expertise, he has enhanced the cassava value chain, fostering sustainable economic growth and development. Currently employing approximately 10 staff, UNUSA envisions scaling up operations to achieve a processing capacity of 20 tons of gari per day upon full automation, creating employment opportunities for over 50 youths. However, UNUSA emphasizes the need for support from both governmental entities and private individuals to fully realize his vision. What I already designed for myself to do that I must do to assist farmers are many. I just started from one. What I want from government is that once they can partner with me or sponsor or give me loan, all this machine will be done at least to assist the farmers. At least from there we will also assist the the government by providing employment. He stresses the potential of his initiative to assist minimize waste and elevate the livelihoods of farmers across Kogi State. Quite ingenious. Now, rape, a heinous crime that leaves devastating scars on its victims, yet many cases go unreported, shrouded in silence. Now this culture of silence emboldens perpetrators, allowing them to strike again with impunity. In our next report, Lion Rig Billy investigates the complex issues surrounding unreported rape cases and the dangers of silence. Despite authorities' severe stance against sexual and gender violence in the country, Cases of rape still persist, with rapists on the prowl preying on unsuspecting victims, knowing fully well it may be difficult for victims to get justice, or worse, might not be reported at all. They don't want their name to spoil it, that this is the girl they raped yesterday in our area. That's why they keep it to yourself. Am I if it's just taking back? I don't want to make people just look me like useless person. Uh, but another person behind to you, then we do it again. Anybody that was raped is not the person's fault. So if you come outside, maybe you see people that will, maybe they will advise you. There are some children that they take them to psychiatry or anywhere that they will just take care of them. So it is better you come out. There you have the courage to face the world. 
A case at hand is a 14 year old girl in the viral video who was allegedly raped by the landlord's son in Alakuko area of Lagos. If not for the social media persistent outcry that got the state police attention, one wonders if such sad development will not have ended unreported. There was public outcry, especially on social media, so that forced the father to prevail on his son. The father actually prevailed on him to submit himself to the police, and that would uh, make the ongoing investigation progress faster. And um, the girl is in the hospital, she's receiving medical treatment, and once um, we conclude our investigation, and if the suspect is found culpable, then it's going to be um, arraigned. Um, the availability of the girl too is important so that she can testify in court. Some findings over the years have shown reasons for unreported, which includes cultural stereotypes, misogyny, and insufficient support for victims because he or she was doubted when they had the courage to report, and many a times they are stigmatized. One of the biggest problems we've seen with the handling rape cases in Nigeria is that unfortunately many people still see rape as a family matter, as a matter to be covered up, you know, and handled hush hush and settle. Uh, most Nigerians uh, do not see rape as a crime against a woman and a girl. If rape occurs in a community, where do they go to? Do these sessions have rape kits? Do all health facilities across Nigeria have rape kits so that they can preserve the evidence of rape? If they don't have this, it's very difficult to prosecute the offender. One could only pray that the teenage girl in question gets justice as investigations begin to unfold. Unfortunately, this is Newsline on the network service. We'll return presently. Thank you and welcome back to the program. It's Newsline on the network service if you've just joined us. Now, get ready to be captivated by the grandeur and romance as Ambassador Motaria Lee Dowra's two lovely daughters tied the knot in a breathtaking beautiful ceremony. Now, the ancient city of Kanu was a buzz with joy as dignitaries from far and wide gathered to witness the union. And our correspondent, Habibu Hassani, takes us on a thrilling journey through the magic of this unforgettable royal affair. Two beautiful daughters of Ambassador Mutari and Dora walking into the venue for the bridal shower of their wedding ceremony. The joyous occasion was colorfully celebrated with musical renditions and dances. Allah. What? Chief Imam of Al Furqan Jumad Mosque, Kanu Dr. Bashir Ali Omar, led the wedding solemnization after the payment of dowry by the representatives of the grooms. <laughs> Elders and well wishers enjoined the new couple to live peacefully and tolerate one another. It's something that everybody have to have it. And uh, we thank Almighty Allah that today we have witnessed our daughters and our sons' marriage today. So we wish them a happy marriage life. I wish them long life. Happy marriage life. I would say they should be prayerful and continue to trust God. And we wish them happy marriage life. Tolerance is very, very important. Anything that it is above their own understanding, they should come together and make sure they understand themselves. I just want them to be patient with each other, love each other, take care of each other, make their marriage be filled with love, understanding, caring. For this day, I'm very excited. I wish them happy marriage life. I wish them happy marriage filled with love and respect and loyalty and my advice to them is to be patient with each other to the new couple the occasion will remain indelible 
I am happy. Wish all the best for me and my bride. I pray for a good <laughs> marriage life. I feel so excited and I'm happy. The historic occasion, peacefully celebrated, will continue to be remembered by the family and friends of Ambassador Mutari Alidora. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Now, finding one's perfect match is truly magical, most especially when both parties share a deep understanding of how to make every day memorable. But beyond walking down the aisle, sharing similar interests, it's also one feature that Victor Egbetokun, son of the Inspector General of Police, is certain will strengthen his marriage to his heartthrob. Anjolo, Anjolo Lua Uriomi. As Michael Olaleya reports, the entire police formation in Nigeria came out to identify what the family of the Inspector General of Police, Kaide Egwetokun, on his joyous occasion. This, no doubt, is a love city with posters and banners of Victor and Angela occupying all corners. A view that reminded many here of love finding solace in sleeplessness because reality is finally better than dream. Seeing that marital vow is the most important thing in the world for the couple at that moment. So then, we have one pleasure. For those that have supported them so far in this long and enduring journey, the beaming smiles and happiness were visible while the newest couple in town were presented to the congregation. Since the entire church community depends heavily on the success of the marriage institution, the couple were told to build their new home around God's principles. Submission, Angela, by you to Victor. It's a divine expectation. And then for Victor, God says, your own part is to love her. The array of guests, including the secretary to the government of the Federation, governors, top government officials, and traditional rulers present, speak follow. The reception lived up to expectations as the lovebirds, guests of unique attributes they share together. In celebrating the magical moment in a unique way that will remain evergreen, both parents danced with a couple before the newlywed took charge. I'm happy that everyone could come to celebrate with us. Vice President Kashim Shetima told the couple to sustain the values inculcated in them by their parents. It's worth repeating that what sustains stable marriages our communication, patience, tolerance, perseverance, and love. They should continue to love each other. They should continue to solve their, their problem by themselves. You have to be honest. You have to be trustful to your wife. And you have to be honest and trustful to you. Carry her along. Um, stay glued to themselves. Cleave unto themselves, as the Bible has said. They need to be tolerant of each other and understand each other and live with love with each other. And they should not allow the third party to enter their marriage. If I wish them children, men and female, and I pray they grow up with their children. The Inspector General of Police, father of the groom, who was visibly happy, shared blissful marital principles necessary for a prosperous family. Marriage comes with a lot of responsibilities. Getting married means being extra responsible. Angela Ulua and Victor Egetoku, congratulations. Now time to serve you Guinness, beer and beverage. The leading African brewer of Guinness uh, beer and beverage is promoting peace, unity and harmony Nigerians, and that's through its English Premier League viewing platforms. 
Now, the Guinness March Day in Lagos is one such initiative that's providing a unique opportunity for all football enthusiasts to come together and enjoy the excitement of the game. Now, we have more on this story from our correspondent, who is a sports enthusiast herself, Diana Ajali. It was another golden opportunity for English Premier League fans in Lagos to enjoy the freeze and threes that often characterize the beginning of a new season via a live viewing platform, Coxie, Guinness, Nigeria, PLC. Through to Haaland, and he get the shot away here, Erling Haaland. The fans watch their various favorite players as they dazzled on the pitch of play in fulfillment of the anticipation and suspense, coupled with some moments of disappointment. Down for Jackson, here's Enzo Fernandez. It was a good beginning for Brentford that ran away with a two goals to one. Victory at the expense of Crystal Palace in match day. One of the league. Manchester City was too hot for Chelsea. That fell flat 0-2 in front of their opponents. Dangerous, Kovacic in 2-0. And in all probability, game over. Impressive. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive from um, Man City's aspect. You know, just as I expected from them. Chelsea, even though they signed... I don't know, the, the player, the best of the best of the players, they can never um, beat down Manchester City for this season. I'm here today supporting Chelsea and I predicted 2-1. I'm on Team Chelsea and we are behind schedule. Guinness Match Day viewing platform is one of the unique ways of Guinness Nigeria PLC show of their unwavering love to their consumers. So as we go into the premiership properly, we will do things like this. We want to show consumers that we love them. The iconic brand Guinness has been here for 260 years, okay? So just to make sure that consumers understand that we're here for them and that we're supporting them this whole season. And we're affiliating it with football. So whenever you think of football, you think of Guinness. So that's basically what we're doing here. 20 clubs are jostling for the 2024-2025 Premier League title with 36 more matches to be played. 2-0 and in all probability game over. All right, for the love of some people, I won't say much about Chelsea, but just to let you know that they are on number eight on the table. They are making progress. All right, let's move on. Perhaps if we had taken to heart the white words of Nelson Mandela, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to him in this language, that goes to his heart. We might have seen a different outcome in the recent Olympics. But this idea resonates strongly, especially when we consider the recent viral video of a Nigerian coach giving instructions in their native language, and that was during an international wrestling championship held in Europe. Now, the athlete's success in that moment wasn't just a triumph of skill. I can tell you it was a powerful testament to the deep connection forged through familiar words. Makes you wonder, could this be a key strategy for our future Olympians? Let's join Kane de la Midi for more. It is a common phenomenon in any sporting activity for athletes to ask specialists or experts who will be given instructions on their performance before and during the tournament. These experts, commonly referred to as coaches, have designated area marked for them to stay. Communication between the coach and athletes plays a key role in achieving this. Language is the code for passing information. The usage of indigenous language recently assisted this female wrestler, world champion, Commonwealth gold medalist, and African Games gold medalist, Odunayo Adokoroye, in defeating a rival from the United States of America. What is the move? What is the move? Did that? 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 that is the voice of the national women okay, okay, coach okay, 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 Akupuriti, after he talked about strategies against the world champion adopted the usage of one of the nigerian's indigenous languages yoruba which eventually paid off it was a serious match that we have been waiting for uh, we have lost to early marilos of the united states of america twice we have drawn our strategy how we are going to uh, defeat Ellie Marilo. So I had to use my Yoruba or local language 
to instruct Odunayo because I have to be awake and I have to keep reminding her of all the strategies, all the things we have planned for uh, the Olympic champion. And I am so happy that it pays off. Some athletes and coaches subscribe to the usage of indigenous languages in passing instructions to the athletes as one of the strategies in reaching a podium finishing at any tournament. So it's rather we speak in our local language to hide our strategy or to keep our strategy away from our opponent. That doesn't mean our coach doesn't understand English. It's just part of our strategy for us to win a competition. The way we have decided is to use our local languages. And that is why you see, for example, sometimes in boxing, I say, Beruwe, 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 Majeko Waya. An athlete is a Yoruba speaking athlete, and you communicate in Yoruba, for instance, if that would make her to understand what you are trying to pass the message and for her to process that information quickly to carry out, carry out the assignment, I think uh, it's, it's a welcome development. Clear, should the Nigerian coaches adopt the usage of indigenous languages in passing instruction to the athletes while competing? This is another topic for another day. All right, I get, I get the drill for, for wrestling, but how do we apply it for track and field? Something like, oh yeah, sorry, 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 oh, so, 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 so. Does it, does it resonate? Let's take a short break. Now, a 21-year-old female graduate, Muji Sholawisu, was brutally murdered just weeks after her graduation. Her body was found at a lorry dump site after a party invitation turned deadly. The police have arrested the mastermind behind her tragic death, bringing some sort of closure to her grieving parents. And Shodla Wahid tells us more. The deceased, Mujishola Awesu, who would have been part of the just completed convocation ceremony of her school, was invited to Iloni for a party by one happiness at Debayo, who is now in police custody. The next time Mujishola will be seen, she was already a dead body. Kwara State Police Public Relations Officer, who confirmed the incident, explained that the deceased left of her town after being promised a sum of 15,000 naira to appear as a pseudo girlfriend of happiness at a party. The call was put across to the deceased who is um, identified as a Mojisola Aweso, and she was contacted by a friend of hers, Timile, to appoint the suspect to a planned, you know, party. The party never existed. He lied using the name of um, two private um, investors. She came to town on the 9th of August, which is on Friday, and then she complained to the roommate that the party did not hold. Then she was in an hotel. The, she wasn't comfortable where she is. And all this one was done to voice uh, notes, WhatsApp message, as it was during the course of you know investigation. We were able to link. You know the roommates came with them, so the picture of the um, girl. You know they have their picture, and then the picture of the cops was shown to them, and uh, that was how we were able to know that the unidentified female cops that was picked up on the 11th was the same person who has been declared missing. The provost of our school, Dr. Isiaku Aliu, expressed sadness over the tragic development, noting that students of the institution are always thought to be worthy in learning and character. Mojisala Awesu was a student of this uh, institution. She was admitted in 2001 and graduated in uh, 2024, precisely in July. She had her final examination. You know, this is a professional institution. We have two exams. That's an academic exam, that's a professional exam. She had the two exams and signed out. You might have seen on social media her uh, dressing that she used for signing out. She signed out about uh, three weeks ago, before the unfortunate uh, incident. This should serve as a deterrent to other students. It is very important that it is, should be a point of learning. Uh, whatever you have should be enough for you. Students Union and a schoolmate had this to say. We plead with the government and we plead with the police agency and all other security agencies to see through this issue and go 
thoroughly with the investigation and bring the co culprit to justice. The little I have to say is she's a kind of person, she's a gentle and calm gay. Yeah, in the little time we spent in church, she's a kind of girl, she's gentle and she's humble. Happiness Adebayo, the prime suspect in the murder of Mujisola Awesu, is said to have been expelled from Summit University for an alleged case of theft and is already in police custody. His father was also invited for questioning. All suspects connected with the murder are expected to be charged to court as soon as investigations are concluded. <laughs> Hmm. All right, tonight we've shared with you inspiring stories of innovation, love, resilience, and of course, wisdom. And let all of these lessons guide us to deeper connection. Remember, pass the legacy of integrity to future generations. And until we see you same time next week again, by God's grace, have a good night.